So I teach, I teach creative coding at Sussex um, in the music department, music technology. And we often introduce um, creative coding to the music students and the media students by saying, well, look, don't worry, it's not computer programming, which is sort of about functional things. It's, you know, creative coding is expressive. It's not, it's not functional, it's expressive. And, and that winds me up a little bit because implicit in that, this, this yellow arrow is sort of saying, well, well, then being expressive isn't functional, which that's not true, is it? So, so this is a sort of a bit of a rant manifesto, which completely unthought through and undeveloped with lots of holes in it. But thinking about why it's important to have kind of expressive explorations of things in the world. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we, may or not get, we may or may not get to the end. So my background, as uh, Alex mentioned, is I, I grew up playing the cello. Um, I was very much a kind of maths and drawing and climbing trees child, not really into computers at all. Um, but I got really into, I did a psychology degree and, and we had it at Leeds and we had brilliant teachers in uh, chaos, sort of chaos approaches to, to, to sensing and perception and also connectionism as it's called then. And that felt very cool to me, that felt to me like dynamical systems felt like a, a good way of understanding the world, but, but I understood it almost sort of poetically. Um, and then I was living in Brighton and there, there was a really good masters there in evolutionary adaptive systems and I kind of peddled up there to speak to them and they said, well, yeah, you can come, um, but you need to program, do you program? And I didn't even have a computer, so they well, you kind of need to learn to program to explore this stuff. So, so I learned to program very much to, as a way of thinking through, as a way of exploring these ideas. But as I say, I'd grown up, like my dad was a carpenter, my mum was a dressmaker, and as I learned to program, I realised that it was sort of the ultimate making things as well, for someone that makes stuff when you're coding, you know, you can sort of make whatever you can imagine. So in around in my master's in sort of 2001-ish at Sussex, I had this, yeah, this sort of mixed environment where there was philosophers and people concerned with like the nature of life and the or sort of origins of life and cognitive science and philosophy of mind. And, and for them, they thought about um, programming and making simulations as a kind of thought experiment. So they talked about it as an opaque thought experiment. Like philosophers sit in their chair, right, and go, what if? And the next step on was go, what if? Well, let's make a model and see what the logical bit of that is. But then at the same way, at the same time, you, you're kind of making stuff. So my, my um, master's and then my PhD was making interactive generative performance software. So you're also then kind of making these things in the world. Um, and yeah, what I want to talk about now is sort of the different ways in which creative coding can kind of underpin these different activities um, of, of, of making, of thinking, making and understanding the world, if that makes sense. So I hope that's not too heavy for a Saturday. I don't know. If it is, stop me and we'll just look at the code. If it's <laughs> better, we can look at like data st structures and stuff too. So, so yeah, my background is, is in, in music, because I grew up playing cello, but not really, not, I didn't study music. Um, and, and the work I've been doing recently is, is for my PhD and, and, and ongoing is sort of applying ideas from ecology. So people like De Scipio have called this ecosystemics. So taking this kind of systems approach to making music with technology inspired by ecology in the natural world. And then there's also some work that if we've got time I'll get onto where, where we're taking some of the ideas from musical ways of thinking and, and, and computer science and, and informatics to kind of s to solve problems in ecology, if you like, and sp specifically in conservation. Um, so, so yeah, reflecting really on, on creative coding and the skills that we have and the ways we have of working as, as creative coders to in the middle of, of these disciplines, in the middle of these ways of thinking. So this, isn't, this wasn't intentionally kind of sententious, <laughs> but, but I started thinking about why I did these things and thinking about for my st students, I suppose, like why it's nice for them, how they can feel good about exploring their aesthetic ideas, which still have relevance in the world. Um, and it has got a little bit evangelical, but, he but anyway, here we go. So, so one thing I'd like to say is that generative art is a kind of speculative fiction, like kind of like, like poetry or science fiction, a way of imagining other, other ways of being. Um, and we're going to we'll look at some examples, particularly around um, evolutionary art and generation diversity, look, thinking about aesthetic problems, if you like, but then reflecting on what we learn by doing that and how we can kind of imagine a better world now. 
Um, so this is intentionally gra super grand, right? I'm not, I don't really mean this, but actually, well, we'll get to the end and you can see if you agree with me or not. Um, so we're going we're gonna to be able to imagine by the end of this uh, post-growth post economy. Um, I'm going to talk about our feedback cello project, Experimental Luthery, and thinking maybe just making up some words randomly, speculative faction. So, so we're not just imagining things like we do in poetry or, or, or science fiction or generative art, but we're making things in the world which kind of change the way we relate with each other and to each other. Um, uh, and, and this is going to change the way we think about um, our, our wider global society. Eventually, maybe not today, but eventually. And then, and then actually this term has already changed and then thinking, yeah, thinking actually of other problems in the real world and things that science and engineering and, 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 and other disciplines are trying to solve and the importance and the role for creative approaches in the mix there. So it's, that's sort of turning it on its head a little bit. Um, so yeah, so starting off generative art as, as, as speculative fiction and, and I'm not alone in sort of thinking along these lines but, you know various people have talked about data art as you know a kind of a new way as it's got a kind of an aesthetic and a political act kind of choose which data sets we we work with in in, in art making mm -hmm. um, but I think for me I, I've always felt like generative art has a particular power in having the sort of imaginative freedom of poetry or sci-fi or this way you know imagining worlds but then we've got this sort of not quite epistemological but we've got this the kind of power of scientific modeling is that as well as making up the story we can kind of implement the story and see if it's logically true like press go and see whether that that, that, that imagined world kind of unfolds as 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 we as we imagine it might um and and so this stuff we're starting off with is all kind of it's all digital in the screen if you like um and the examples I'll share are from some work, it was actually my postdoc um, back in 2007 working with John McCormack and Alan Dorin, who any, if anyone works in generative art, they were, um, um, John was a pioneer in sort of, in generative video particularly, and they both have this mixed, like artificial life filmmaking background. So I was working with them for a couple of years on um, looking at the ecosystem as a metaphor in generative art and thinking about how, how maybe some ideas from that <coughs> can help us make more interesting and by interesting we mean kind of more complexity, more, more, more diversity in our, in our electronic, there is called electronic media then. Um, so, so people are probably familiar with generative art now, any of our favourite like creative coding frameworks when we download it, it has an examples folder with boids or you know, flocking algorithms in, we're familiar with this sort of um, basic idea of generative art and here it is framed in biological terms, so with the artist creates some kind of generative process and we can think about this as the genotype in, in biological terms and that generates a kind of a, a phenotype, a thing that we can experience um, and we might have there might be some kind of physical or computational interaction between the two and then the and then the audience kind of experience that 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 phenotype and 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 this is what you know, people like Brian Eno have talked about this is this instead of being the, the cre you know creating things directly we're more like a gardener so we kind of set the conditions and then we stand aside and we kind of nurture this thing as it grows um, and I've mentioned, yeah, those things like Boyd's, we're familiar with this idea of um, we set these low-level rules and this idea of emergence, right, and this stuff, this stub comes out that we didn't completely predict. Um, and, and we were working particularly with evolutionary art, so evolutionary algorithms, where you don't even design necessarily these particular rules. You kind of, you set, you set some kind of conditions where those rules themselves can evolve. Yeah, is everyone from, has anyone never heard of evolutionary that's all that's familiar to everyone here that's that sort of idea yeah um, so the challenge then is like how do we define these these fitness functions how we, how do we define these 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 um these kind of evolutionary pressures so that we get uh, interesting or engaging whatever we mean by that art whatever we mean by that so so this is sort of a schema for for uh, evolutionary computation in general and this could be, you know, this, this sort of scheme could be for, I don't know, designing an aeroplane wing or finding holes in international tax law. Um, we have an initial, uh, initial population that's random. We create a population. We have some kind of mechanism to um, select a parent, 
Um, and then the parents we, we breed, so we take in this biological metaphor, yeah? And we have some kind of, maybe some idea of, wh of when we stop. Um, and in, and in, in an artistic context, then it's this, this sort of parent selection. How do we do the fitness function, the, the evolutionary pressure is kind of what, we're, what our sort of design challenge is or part of our design challenge, right? So if we think about this in um, reflecting on, on, on the evolutionary metaphor in the real world, when people use this in engineering, often it's a, it's, um, it follows this kind of selective breeding. So like if we breed cows, we want to have more milk or meteor rumps or pigeons, we want them to fly faster. We have this kind of <coughs> predetermined goal that we're trying to fulfil. Um, but, but actually when we're making music often or making other visual art, we don't necessarily have this particular goal in mind. It's a bit more open-ended, right? And, it, and if we think about it, that's actually how things in the real world also are. So in a, in a rainforest, there's not... Evolution itself isn't actually teleological. It doesn't have a fixed endpoint. It's about being, you know, surviving in the current conditions and creating offspring that also survive, right? So it's totally dynamic and situated. It's dependent on the here and now. And that, and that feels much more intuitive and much more relevant to us as musicians, right? So it's not that there's like some end point. Well, you can. You can evolve a, ha a correct harmonisation of a Bach chorale, which people have done. But it's not that interesting. What's more interesting is like me here and now, maybe improvising or interacting with other people. How can I alter my m digitally specified <coughs> musical materials in a way that's sort of engaging me? So... So taking inspiration from, from the real world again of how, how that works. Um, and this, I'm just sort of setting some context for, for, for um, some, of the, some of the insights of the stuff I want to share. So sorry if this feels a bit like an ecology lecture suddenly. Um, but one, one way of doing that is, is to say, well, if there's not any fixed goal like I want a, rump, you know, a meaty rump, if I'm, what I'm saying is I want to stay alive if we're staying with this biological metaphor. And one way of doing that is to um, implement some kind of um, energy model, if you like. So this is like familiar from, from artificial life models. Um, providing this energy model is some way, it's like providing an implicit fitness function. We don't have to say, you know, I want notes that are in the key of C or I want loud notes or I want quick notes because we don't know what notes we want. It depends on what we've played now, right? We want everything to be context specific and dynamic. And one way of doing that is to, is to, to supply um, or define this sort of implicit fitness, right? So this is like in the real world, the sun shines and, and, and plants grow and then the, the plants that are better at converting the sun into energy grow more, right? And then the ones that avoid being eaten by the, the sheep last longer, but the sheep who are good at eating plants, they're more successful, so on and so forth. So we have this kind of energy flow through uh, layers in the, in, the, in the ecosystem. And this is, this is this kind of, this is pretty standard behavior in, in when you're making models in this way, and it's about competition, right? Like who can compete for the energy and we get competition and, and, and that's, that's one way of designing systems. Um, but actually in the real world, that's just one half of the story. And we've also got the death and decay stuff often isn't discussed. And actually this is where all the good shit literally happens is, is where we have not only, it, so we have the, the, the grass and the plants and the, and the, and the sheep and, uh, and then the wolves and the, well, it's wolves. We haven't got any pred any peak pred predators left in this country. That's the problem. At the moment, we're the, we're the only secondary carnivores. Eventually, we die and we get buried, and and the worms eat us. There's a song from around here about this, um, and we get eaten. And then there's you know we get broken down by by bacteria and fungus and stuff. And and then there's some other carnivores actually that eat that. So we get this cycle. Is the point right? And there's this actually there's this recycling of matter in the real world. And that messy, dirty, death, rotting stuff was missed out of these models for ages. Um, so that was one thing we I was looking at um, back 
in, in, in 2007 was saying, what happens if we bring in this, the rotting bit? What happens if we bring the rotting stuff, the death and the rotting back, back in? And what we can think about then is, is, is instead of focusing on competition, which is what we normally have in evolutionary computation, we can think about how we get some cooperation and maybe more symbiotic um, approaches and, and relationships. Okay, so this is, we've gone really abstract. We're about to like look at things again, don't worry. <laughs> um, so we'll look at some things and then it'll make more sense. So this is a, this is a, 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 a project um, that, was, that was called Filterscape that's thinking about en this, this abstract ideas of energy recycling, but in, in generative art. Okay, so my other big bugbear at the time was, was, was making some like maths <coughs> models and then defining a mapping from my model to you know pitch or to colour or whatever. It felt, it, it, I just, it just, I don't know. I just felt really dissatisfied by it because the, the these mappings that we define, which we're all familiar with if we do any gestural stuff, um, particularly, often felt really arbitrary. What I was interested in is could we make these models that were sort of fundamentally embedded in the media we were working with. Um, and so th in the first example, this is, these are little creatures, if you like, the little agents that live in a, in a filter, in a spectral filter. Um, in fact, I'll just play it so it's easier to see. So these are little agents. Each one of these guys is an agent. Its little arm, it sucks in energy from, this is a spectral filter. It sucks in energy from a particular band, and then its arm is where it spits out the energy as well. So that's the recycling bit, yeah? So the, um, the, green, the, the green stuff is the energy that's recycled in the world, and the red stuff is like the sun shining down and putting more energy in the world, and that's randomly distributed, right? So these guys, they're just defined by how big they are, and the big guys move around more slowly but they can eat more stuff and the little guys can move around more quickly and they use less energy to move so there's this sort of trade-off right and then their arm is where they spit back the energy into the world okay and that's it so the point with this the sort of game with generative art is like what's the minimal rule set i can make for the most complex like ongoing complexity and diverse behavior okay so What's quite interesting in this world is that if there's no recycling, if these guys don't have arms, then they just surf about on here, right? They just surf up and down and you don't get any of this like longer term variation. It's, all, it's just monotonous. There's always the same amount. But what we find, and this is just like, this isn't presented as an artwork or a composition. It's kind of like a study. What we find is, see like for example at the end, these guys are all hanging out at the end, because I didn't quite think it through. Well, I know I did think it through, and I decided that it made no sense. This is a spectral filter, right? Low frequency to high frequency. It makes no sense to wrap it. So at the end of the world, it's like, if I reflect my, I, if I'm at like, I can't remember how much it is, probably, probably 2200, and I live at the end, then I'm gonna spit my energy back, and I can reflect back and basically like eat my own frequency output, yeah, so I can live off my own recycled energy. And so what was happening is those guys kind of worked out that they could hang out at the end and like feed themselves. So what happened there is like the whole world ne it nearly died out, but these guys were the most successful. Meanwhile, the rest of the world was filling up with energy. So we get this like really amazing like variation in the population distribution but also in these kind of survival strategies. So like sometimes they also work out that they can hang out in clusters and it's like, okay, you feed me and I'll feed you and you feed me and I'll feed you. And they kind of hang out in these like mutualistic clusters. And the point of this is that none of that was programmed in, right? All it was programmed in was like, I, 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 I have a size, I have a, an, a direction and a sort of distance that I chuck my energy back and I want to survive, like that's it, right? So what we're interested in is like, by, by introducing, instead of, instead of taking the like competition model of evolution and evolutionary art making, if we, if, we, if we make a situation where symbiosis can occur, then we get this, the, all this other stuff for free, basically. We get this like free variation, yeah? Does that sort of make sense? Yeah, so it's, like, it's not like, 
oh my god, that's beautiful. <laughs> like the, the sound of it, it's like a random spectral filter being swept, right? Yeah. But what is quite beautiful to me anyway, <laughs> is the amount of variety we get. We get this variation in survival strategies, as I call them a bit slightly grandly, and then this huge variation in like the population size and, and over time. And that will, that will run and it'll, it'll just go on. So I've, I've tweaked a few things. I think that the main tweak is like, if everything does die out, I tuned the parameters quite carefully so you often get just like one little guy left and you find yourself, you know, like, yeah, come on, you can do it, you can do it. And then all of a sudden the whole world's filled up with energy and it's like, phew, we've got this massive population explosion. So there's this sort of an insight, if you like, that through this, by putting in recycling and cooperation, we get this diversity. And, and also then... Um, so, so, and this idea of, of embedding the generative process in the media itself. So that was, a, that was an example in a filter. It was like, you know, part of these studies is like, what's the simplest way of making things? Um, a, another variation on it, um, so tiny brightness recycling. So I, 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 I did my PhD in a computer science department, so everyone's really into puns. Some of you might appreciate them, but some people, anyway. Um, so this is, this is a similar idea, so energy recycling... Um, but in, in visual, so in pixel space instead, right? And, and, and one thing I've always been really interested in, musically, I was interested in, in the kind of, like lots of people, in the kind of organic and the digital, and how do we, ca you know, what, what, why, why are there, why are there s the sort of complexities and the, and, and, the, and the, 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 yeah, the sort of dynamic complexities and the, and the aesthetic complexities which we have in the real world, why is that so difficult to get in, in digital spaces? And there's lots of simple reasons, but exploring ways of, of creating these more kind of organic patterns. So this is a little um, a similar, a similar um, idea in pixel space. So the, the rules, if you like, there's, there's a bunch of agents that live in pixels and, and they want to survive as well. It's, again, it's an evolutionary thing. And the, the agents are defined by... Actually, we can have a look. Um, oh, sorry. Um, let me see. So the agents, the agents, just to demonstrate how simple. Oh, uh, sorry, I'm not very. Where's an agent? So you can, the agents are just defined by this is sorry, this is a really long time ago, so I can't remember. Uh, where's an agent? There's the world. <coughs> agent, agent, agent. I must have passed it. Where's it birthing it? <coughs> Where's its definition? Ah, <coughs> oh, there we are. So they're literally just to find, so they have an ID so that you can find them. They've got an age, so when they reach a certain age, you kill them. And they have a, they have a type, and that's their main, their main attribution, right? So naught is they like dark pixels, and when the dark pixel eaters seek dark pixels, and they, eat, they literally eat the brightness and reduce the brightness value, and they make them bright. And if they're what, I can't remember which is which, naught, I think, is dark pixel eaters, and one is white pixel eaters, and then, but they can, it's continuous. So in the middle, they're kind of generalists, and they don't really care either way, but they'll get less energy defined. So the, the, either they're specialist and they, they have to have a particular pixel colour, but they get more energy from it, or vice versa, right? And that's pretty much it. There's a, a t I put in a tendency as well. So when they're looking for a space to live, there's a sort of tendency to maybe m move in a line rather than move in any direction, just to add a little... You'll see that as it happens, actually. So um, if I start this... Running, you'll s well, I'll tell you, yeah. So that's basically, uh, where's my mouse gone? Yeah, so the bright, the dark pixel eaters, uh, so he's 0.4, he's sort of not, not completely specialist, will, will look for dark pixels. So basically, each time step, they just look around their immediate neighborhood, find the darkest pixel, move there, reduce the bright, uh, increase the brightness, or decrease it, right? That's it. That's the that's the rule, um, but what you get is this like quite amazingly dynamic, and if I do it, uh, let's 
I make the world really small, you'll see really quickly. Um, and it looks just like mold. It just looks like mold growing, which wasn't like an aesthetic decision at all. It was purely like. Oh, here we are. Sorry. Look, I'm going to run it again so you can see it coming from. Where it start? If I do a really small one. Yeah. Where's my zoom? Yeah. So, so you get this like. If I do that, you can see these are the agents, and this is the population distribution. So actually, we get this again, this sort of co this coexistence where the white guys. So basically, the white guys make space for the make the food that the black guys need, and vice versa. Yeah. So it's this sort of energetic utopia, um, and and it's yeah, it's incredible. There must be some other bias that it always moves up. I can't remember why, to be honest. Um, so we'll just leave that, I'll make a big one and leave it running, we'll leave a bigger one running so we can see it, see what happens over time. But what we get as well is this, uh, we've run out of space. I'll leave that one running, it's really inefficient. I, I'm, I, I, like, co I like coding to sort of make things, but I'm not interested in optimising things, so nothing's very efficient. Um, yeah, so what we get is this, um, I sort of talked about it as like the best of all possible worlds where we, where we, we have this sort of perfect utopia and, and, and again through this sort of symbiosis, through this recycling, we get this quite amazing really kind of visual complexity and also dynamic complexity of, of how things sit together. So. Um, this all suddenly, this all felt a little bit abstract in 2007, and then suddenly now it all suddenly feels a bit more relevant. And I don't know, <coughs> Pretty Patel's recent manifestos and and just the, the the state of the world made me made me think. At this time, I often thought if I quit academia, I'd quite like to just go and teach like systems biology to eight-year-olds because the world probably would be a bit of a better place if we, if we understood this. And it struck me that playing with this kind of stuff is such a good way to, un to understand the complexities of the, of the, of the bigger world and, and understanding this very simply that this, like you can't recycle energy in the real world, right? That's the whole problem. We lose it from heat. But, but, but recycling, thinking about recycling matter and materials more, realising that this, this, this supports these kind of symbiotic behaviours which, which, which reciprocally kind of create diversity, heterogeneity in our environments, which then in turn support diversity, right? Um, which supports diversity in, in agents and their, and their behaviours. So, so stability and complexity and, and harmony, if you like, come out of recycling and symbiosis rather than growth and competition, which is sort of what our world has become based on. So sorry if it feels a bit sententious, but suddenly, these kind of alternative post-growth realities of donut economics don't feel like some like weird fairy tale of like, well, that's all very nice, but how could that be? It's like, no, that's obviously how we should live. Like this is, this, this, yeah, it doesn't feel like a sort of fantastical fairy tale. We see pictures like this of renewables recycling and, and thinking about the need to recycle um, sort of technology as well as biology. Th and that we understand this isn't like just just a, a sort of industrial model, but actually there's a kind of aesthetics and the dynamics of it, which is really beautiful. And it, it is actually the only way to live, not not like some weird lefty alternative. So this is but, uh, uh, yeah, this is like wildly hand wavy on purpose. But if there's you know Saturday in Huddersfield is a space for this kind of shit, right? So grand challenge one. <laughs> Creative coding can help us imagine a post-growth economy, all right? So I claim that, th that through creative coding, we can understand the complexities of the real world by tinkering with, with, I with models in the creative domain. And people do this, right? And I mean, this is what Earth system scientists do, but they don't do it in a way that's so sort of immediate and, and, and that we can really engage with. And I, and I, I do think there's a real value in, in, the, in the creative exploration of these things in... in in um, understanding and imagining the world. So that's what I'm calling speculative fiction, okay? <coughs> Part one. Part two, uh, speculative faction. This is um, 
So I think maybe everyone in here, hands up if you make instruments of some kind. OK, so I think we're all speculative faction makers. Um, so I all got, when, yeah, when I was in Australia, we started off with these very sort of kind of artificial lifey, almost scientific agent based models. And then I got more and more Zen with it. And I was more and more trying to simplify it and simplify it and simplify it and simplify it and think where the origin of this kind of complexity was what's the simplest model we can make that still gives us this kind of engaging and ongoing open-ended complexity if you like and ended up with a delay line <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, with a with a uh, so an adaptive delay line it's literally just like a buffer and you monitor the amplitude and if the amplitude the overall amplitude in your buffer is is, is too big then you then you shift the, the, the length of the delay line slightly. And I'm sorry, I haven't, I tried to, it's just on for a laptop so you can play it like this, but it's, it doesn't compile in on this machine anymore. Um, so it all got a bit, it all got a bit zen and I realised that actually I didn't give a shit about making simulations and solving the kind of A-life problem of, of synthetic complexity that actually as a musician, I just need to bring stuff back into the world and the messiness of the world is more interesting. And so I really wanted to bring that back into my performance um, practice. Um, and I wasn't really sure how. And then I saw a beautiful video um, of, of Hildur, who's recently shot to fame by winning all the Oscars for her Joker film. This is probably back in about 2013. I saw this film of her playing this instrument. And, 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 and I just had a very childish, like, oh, I want one of those. And it was made by this guy, Haldor, who happens to be a really good friend of my colleague, Thor Magnusson, who many of you might know. And Haldor came to do a talk at Sussex. And I said, oh, Haldor, can, can we make one? How about we make uh, a cello in, into one? And we were hosting Ickley that year. So as artistic director, I decided to make a feedback cello workshop. And so Haldor came to visit us. And myself and Chris Kiefer, some of you might know from Live Coding World, decided to make a project of a feedback cello project. So I, as, as, as kind of classically trained cellist, if you like, wanting to bring digital generative processes into cello playing, and he as a live coder who's really into gestural interaction and expressive controllers, wanting to, to bring physical stuff into his live coding practice. And so we started this very, very open-ended, very um, intuitive, sort of improvised process of, of building these feedback cellos. So these are cellos um, with pickups underneath the strings. These are, these are um, really nice, uh, they're guitar pickups, but very beautifully made um, and, and on a sort of slightly hacked 3D printed um, pickup holder. That's blue tack, you can see it's a very technical um, intervention because what happened was when I was first playing with it, <coughs> I kept getting feedback on a pitch that was nothing to do with either the string or, the, or, 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 or a harmonic of a string. And I realised it was these guys are quite thin. It was the pickup arms. It was the, like, the, the fundamental frequency of the pickup arms that I was getting. So a bit of blue tack stopped that. So you get the pickups and then you chop the signal from the pickups. In my, in my one currently, it just goes through an analogue mixer. And in Chris's, it goes through Super Collider, and we'll look at that in a sec. And then that, those, the signals get summed, and it goes to a speaker that's been chopped and bolted into the back of the cello. Right, so, so you get this kind of feedback loop. Uh, this is me in the middle, or Chris. Um, so normally, normally we, we excite the strings with our bow, right, and, and, and then we control the, the bow length with our, with our uh, string length with our fingers. And this, <coughs> this feedback cello kind of flips that loop round. So instead, it's self-exciting because the string vibrations um, picked up by the pickups, that's amplified, <coughs> they just transduce it in the body and then that body, instead of, it is amplifying the vibrations of the cello, but it's also acting, yeah, it's being, it's being externally, by the transducer, by the speaker, it's vibrating and those vibrations are going the other way back through the bridge to excite the strings, if that makes sense. So what you get is a, um, a self-resonating cello. So um, I put a, uh, some sympathetic, well not sympathetic, some drone strings underneath as well. So I've got four, four the normal four strings and then another couple that I can leave as droning so I can play. But, so I'm off camera just, I'm just controlling the gains manually. Just 
just to see where the edges of each one is, right? So it's a little game we're trying to play of like, can we get them all oscillating? And actually you can, but we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. So, so this is sort of, there's a few things that interest me about this project, but one of them is, is thinking about, we're all starting, we've all been talking about agency loads and everything's an agent now. Um, but, but there's something particular about our musical instruments that, that definitely plays a role in our, in our musical decisions. And, 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 and in, these, in these instruments, they're like, it's literally self-resonating. So it's got this, I've started talking about it as a kind of dynamical autonomy. It's, it's got this literal autonomy from myself. I don't have to inject any energy into it. It vibrates by itself, right? Um, so that's one. That's this purely analog version, and we've purposefully kept these slightly parallel developments. Then Chris's one um, goes through uh, a patch, a super collider. So um, this is Chris's code. He's much more terse and poetic than I am in my code. But basically, you you get this. You reading the. He's got some. He's got a controller. He's built as well some knobs for the front of his cello, so he can control the values on the super collider patch. Um, so what's he doing? He's getting the, the gains from the knobs, right, and mapping the knobs to the, to, to, to the gains on his strings. Then he's, then he's scaling, scaling and mixing, the, those are the four strings, um, scaling it by 30. He likes to push it all to the edge. And then, and then um, getting the mean of it, right? And then, and then, then you can do a bunch of different stuff with it. Um, in the simplest version, he basically takes the this, this, this four strings and then adds them all together and works out the relative contribution in terms of amplitude to the overall signal and then sends back the inverse, if you like. So it's basically just saying, if you're, if you're, loud, if you're relatively loud, get quieter, and if you're relatively quiet, get louder. And just with that really simple patch, partly because he's pushing it right to the edge, you get this amazingly responsive system. So suddenly the strings are like controllers. So you're just touching, oh, I'll just play that again so you can see, look, as he's touching the strings, like ever so lightly, because he's interrupting their self-oscillation, then that becomes a control signal that then is changing the way the gains come back in, right? So it's still a cello, like physically, and I suppose we should also remind ourselves that cellos are are also non-linear, right? It's, so there's some, probably some acousticians in the room that's like the textbook example of a non-linear dynamical system, the, the string, but at the, at the kind of timbral level, right? So if there's any string players or woodwind players you spe or wind players, you spend your life working you know, on, your, on your timbre, on your, on your bow control, your breath control, because these are dynamical complex systems, but, but they're not at, at the higher levels of like rhythm and form, these like longer tongue musical things. But, but in these instruments, they, they do become that. So all of our kind of learned sensory motor contingencies are, are out the window. There is no like one-to-one -one mapping between our interface, between, uh, between our interface and our sound producing mechanism. It's like, you can kind of come to learn it, but only by switching off your brain completely and approaching it very intuitively, right? So um, this is, there's a saxophonist and a drummer as well. And what I enjoyed is, you've, timbrely, you've got a whole new range. So you've got these like, um, so you've suddenly got this kind of multiphonic, you're sitting in the same sort of multiphonic world as a, as a saxophone, which for me as a cellist is really nice because I grew up in, in orchestras where you had to like all play together at the same time to have an impact. And, and suddenly like, you're in a world with a saxophone and a drummer, like on your own terms, <laughs> which is which is kind of so. There's some there's some obvious kind of uh, yeah timbral sonic characteristics, but really what I'm interested in at the moment as well is it's like it's not about mastering your instrument in the way that the conservatoire is. It's about like totally approaching it as itself 
and exploring it on its ter- on its own terms, right? It's it, 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 so people like Ingold. You've you've talked about Ingold a lot, saying you know we don't impose form on objects; we let the path unfold. It's like well, obviously we do. You know that's not news, is it, to an improviser? And these instruments it, it kind of embody that approach. You you can only have that approach. You can only come to it as it is and explore it on its own terms. And, it, and that's very rewarding actually as well, right? So it's about listening and responding and negotiating as it is with playing with other, other, other humans. Um, and and, there's, and the, I, at the moment we're thinking about, there's a big interest in feedback instruments and I'm not sure why you could probably, we could probably do a sociological, socio-political analysis of it. Um, but so Haldor has been doing a PhD with us as well at Sussex with Thor and with Chris, um, and he's he's also exploring this this uh, by interviewing different musicians about using these instruments and the the the, the output. So including <coughs> people like Hildur, part of the um, appeal, if you like, is this sort of stimulating uncontrollability. This I- this idea, and anyone who's interested, it's probably lots of people in the room who play with interested sort of drawn to these dynamical systems these complex systems precisely because we can't quite control them you know we have to like approach them a- as they are and kind of explore those possibilities on the fly in 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 performance and that's 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 super rewarding um we've made a, a kind of a house band if you like so our, our music department house band is the brain dead ensemble um Named particularly for this fact that you you can't have a you have to turn your brain off like you can't have a predetermined idea about what it is you're going to do, and also somehow and I'm, it, I don't know if it's the droniness of them or what, but it does do something to your frontal lobotomy it's, and it's perfect antidote to midterm teaching brain. Like after about half an hour, it's like you've been on retreat for about a week. You just mm-hmm. in this beautiful space so I'll share that with you anyway at some point um, so we've made this band called the brain dead ensemble so there's feedback cello and feedback cello that's me and Chris and there's a uh, an ex-PhD student Thanos who made a double bass version and we made it on my old bass that's just a flat got a flat back so so rather than chopping a speaker <coughs> into it it's got a piece of plywood with a transducer mounted bolted on so we're kind of exploring non-invasive ways too and then Thor on the threnoscope. So uh, the threnoscope is a live coded microtonal drone instrument. So it's made in super collider and it's a multi-channel drones in microtones. So instead of having like four, eight speakers, there, there are some speakers in the room, speaker, 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 but then the outputs also come in to our signal pathway, right? So it means that when Thor is sending something out, he may or may, we, we, to him, we're a kind of coloured speaker, um, but we can also turn his gain down, so we can also silence him. And and to us, he's he's like another input into our system. So if he saturates, he can push our system and saturate it, and suddenly we've got this like other thing to deal with that we really don't know what's going to go on because we have we literally have no control over it. This is really fun. <laughs> this band's like super fun to 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 play with because you've got no idea not only what's going to happen, but actually really who's doing what. So we'll play, especially in smaller venues, and we seem to play a lot in, 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 in sort of techno clubs where there's a big PA and, and you literally have no idea who's doing, who's doing what. And that's, that's really nice. Um, so gratuitous plug, it's also available on Spotify. Um, so... This wasn't why we intended this project. This project was, yeah, as I say, grew very intuitively out of um, in, well, long-term interest in, in complexity and feedback and dynamical systems and, and, and the sort of differences in, in generative, making generative processes which you sort of define and then unleash in the world and, and, and growing up playing acoustic, used to play French horn and trombone and cello and that, that very immediate kind of gestural expression and, and wondering about what the meeting point is, what, you know, what, what, how do you bring those things together in hybrid, in hybrid instruments. But then more and more through playing it, realising that there is this kind, of, this kind of autonomy, if you like, that, that I was part of the, 
like live algorithms for music, that kind of scene of like, you know, in, 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 in software um, improvising agents, that, that's kind of the, a golden goal, isn't it? It's like, how do we make this software that, that like has its own musical agenda and, 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 and that's been defined in many different ways. My favourite, what Jonathan Impit gave a really nice, he forgets, he forgets he gave it, but he, for me, it, I liked it. He said, he said, I, I don't, you know, I'm not thinking about this formally like someone like <coughs> Geraint Wiggins might think about it in, in beautiful but very formal terms. Uh, and, and, and Jonathan just said, oh, anything that invites attributions of intentionality, which for me made a lot of sense, because it's like, well, sod it, doesn't really matter formally what it's doing, as long as it makes me as a musician or me as an audience kind of be like, oh, you know, where did that come from? Or where is that pushing me? That made, that made a lot of sense. Um, but, but making these physical instruments that, that, that physically vibrate on their own for a start, and then and then have these other uh, kind of dynamical th relationships. Um, what's the best way of putting it? Well, they have this sort of independence, this sort of autonomy, right? That that that's, that's, that that we can't impose our will on. We, it demands that we explore this this together. And and that for me, the fact that they're physically in the world changes from this from from what I'm calling speculative fiction to speculative faction because it, it makes us live out these different relationships, right? It makes me it makes me live that experience. It becomes a kind of interpersonal experience of living with an other on its on its own terms. Yeah? Um, and, and and so uncontrol again is like a kind of a trendy term that we think about in our I think in fact that lovely installation uh, uh, is, the, is the person here who made the installation in the what is really is yeah. no um, but yeah he uses uncontrol right uncontrolled by an Arduino I think it says on it um, it's a really beguiling way of being right so rather than rather than thinking about relationships as like with our instruments or with each other as this way of being in the world where we control things and we determine things it's like no we sit back a little bit and and actually what we gain from being a little bit less in control is is incredibly rich and uh i'm not i'm not uh i don't always anyway Milo Ponti talks about this a lot. It's very trendy, isn't it? This whole within within cognitive science, there's a move within within philosophy. There's this move. Um, people like Hannah de Jaeger talking about participatory sense making. That this is a big gap in our kind of understanding of the world and of cognition. That the the ultimate cognition isn't actually playing chess and solving problems and all these things that we've thought that 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 that. Um, that uh, cognitive science has sort of been concerned with. So people like Hannah are saying, actually, no, being in love is the peak of, of, <laughs> of, of, of human um, intellect, if you like. This idea, this, and, and in <coughs> within, within artistic practice, there's a lot of interest in you know, exploring relational dynamics. Um, Karen Mac Kim McLaren is also talking about letting be, which she takes from, from developing from, from Merleau-Ponty. So suddenly this stuff, which seems very abstract and poetic, so this, uh, if you've had, yeah, well, I'll let you read that if you haven't. Um, this idea that there's the, 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 the thing itself, we both, which only by letting things be, that we actually fully understand them, that we can actually have relationships which are which are meaningful, and actually for me, these like really noisy, brutal instruments really embody that. They actually help us live out that experience. They kind of reify this much more abstract, but beautiful and meaningful. But they make this shit really meaningful, and 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 we kind of, yeah, we 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 live it out. So again, to have like a really grand claim. Um, Arguably, the problem with where we are now is, is you know, we've had this sort of colonial, extractive um, approach to, to controlling the world and like, here we are, we're going to do this. Actually, if we sit back and move beyond colonialism and extractivism and let other humans and other creatures and other processes be, then that, so I suppose from moving from competition and control to a kind of symbiotic entanglement again we can make sense of these words which are coming up these terms which come up again and again in in, in feminist and in cognitive science and all these different um ways of ways of knowing i don't know it feels to me like my experiences playing these instruments make that real 
And maybe if like we taught feedback instruments in schools, maybe we need to go and get Pretty to Pep, Pretty Patel to make some. We need to take some like, um, yeah, feedback instruments into Parliament would sort of. So part three is like problem in the world. Grand challenge number three: reverse biodiversity loss. We're keeping it. We're not like you know, we're going for the big challenges. <coughs> so this is. I mean, some of you I've talked before about with this. Um, I'll give you a try and do a 30 second. Um, climate emergency, carbon dioxide's a problem, other big problem, massive biodiversity loss. As we saw, we need complexity, we need diversity, they're kind of self reinforcing. It's actually going to be quite a bad, we're approaching a really potentially devastating point of no return. That's real, that's, that's like now, but we can't do anything there's loads of there's been loads of like multilateral initiatives for the last 20 years so HE 2020 that's this year there was a huge global initiative to say let's reverse biodiversity loss oh dear we failed partly because how do we measure biodiversity so this is a, this is a whole nother this is a whole nother talk but um well we can't like we measure biodiversity by traditionally by standing in the woods counting birds but but we can't count all the birds in the <coughs> Amazon because there's so many different ones that actually no one even knows what they are so that doesn't work so there's been a whole move for the last 10 years I suppose to look for um, remote sensing technologies people use satellite technologies for example to like measure the trees but that doesn't that's got all sorts of problems so um, lots of people have started then listen realizing that sound so stethoscopes, doctors, stethoscopes, understanding our guts, our hearts, our lungs, our internal biological systems. Ecologists now listening to the ecosystem as a way of, of, of understanding the health of ecosystems, right? Um, one approach, Dan Stow, some of you may know, there's an uncanny number of ex-experimental musicians who've moved in, who work in this world, and, and that was the sort of message from the third part, really. There's a bunch of musicians who, who had the insight to suggest this decades ago, and, and the ecologists said, don't be so silly. Now ecologists are going, yes, what a brilliant idea. Um, so I've been working in this area for about five years, exploring this. So Dan, Dan is doing this sort of deep learning um, let's identify robins and owls and identify individual calls in a kind of portrait, let's say like portrait listening. But the other approach is to do a kind of um, landscape listening and think, so instead of, if any of you work in music information retrieval, instead of identifying the instruments of the orchestra, the other approach is to say, how good is the orchestration? So the, um, yeah, I think there's not time to go into it hugely, but there's like, there's, so I've been doing lots of this stuff <laughs> in the tropics. So it's like mud, mud in the tropics and then muddy multivariate stats. <laughs> and the kind of short message, short version is it works. You can do it, right? You can listen to biodiversity. Um, but the problem is there's loads of stuff. Uh, we get these brilliant, uh, if anyone does clustering, we get these brilliant results where our indices cluster better than the, the ecologists' old methods of doing things. But because we have these, like, because the multivariate stats is so dense, like with neural networks and AI, it's, it's really hard to interpret. So we don't really know what it is our models are saying. So the kind of message of the final bit, so it's another, is <laughs> to say, yes. what we need to do is be more experimental and creative and like explore stuff like I don't know if some of you may know Luc, Luc Dubois or like ma use our kind of creative coding our creative tools to like bring some sensory stuff back to empiricism that was the final message <laughs>